Before all you Apple fanboys bash me in the comments, I'm not saying Apple Silicon is bad. I have an M1 MacBook Air right here, and I love it. However, despite what some YouTubers say, Apple Silicon is not perfect, and they have some general downsides that anyone looking to buy an Apple Silicon machine should be aware about. Here are, in my opinion, the top 5 issues that you should know about the Apple Silicon Macs. And while not all of them will apply to you, some of these compromises are so big they can drastically impact your experience on an Apple Silicon Mac, so be sure to watch until the end. A small thing before we begin, you need to be aware that Apple Silicon isn't magic. In some cases, the hype machine has made the computers seem like insane powerhouses. And while they're certainly powerful machines that are incredibly capable, just keep in mind that these things do have their limits too. They're not supercomputers. I'm not saying that Apple Silicon Macs aren't fast, they're definitely very fast and powerful, just don't expect the performance of a $5,000 custom-built gaming PC with an Intel i9 12th gen and an RTX 3090 Ti with 128 gigs of RAM in a base model M1 MacBook Air. That being said, this shouldn't be an issue for the vast majority of people because even the base model M1 MacBook Air has enough performance to suit most people's use cases and I'm not bashing it, I'm just trying to manage expectations. Alright, let's get started with the actual compromises you make if you choose to get an Apple Silicon Mac. Now, if you're a Mac person and you're coming to Apple Silicon from another Mac, that's great. You'll have no trouble feeling comfortable in your new Mac. However, most people still use PCs, and if you're a PC user and you're looking to jump to a Mac, there's going to be a big learning curve. You'll have to learn a whole new file system, different keyboard shortcuts, different ways to close apps, a new layout. Some people love the transition, like me, and get used to Mac quickly. And some people can't stand using an unfamiliar operating system and go right back to Windows, where they're comfortable. This also brings up the issue of software compatibility. Some of us don't have the privilege of choice. Some apps on Windows might not be optimized or even available for Mac. This is crucial if you're getting a Mac for work and have work-related apps that are only available on Windows. Be sure to check if all the apps you need are available on Mac OS or if you can find a suitable alternative. What if you run Windows on Mac? Intel Macs had a feature called Boot Camp that allowed users to install Windows onto a Mac natively. However, with the new Macs with Apple Silicon, the only way you can run Windows on Mac is through emulation, through an app like Parallels or through virtual machines. This isn't ideal for most people since you'll have to use a Windows Insider developer or beta release on ARM, which isn't very stable and there will likely still be issues with compatibility, not to mention the performance loss when running things through emulation. I've had my Windows 11 ARM virtual machine fall apart twice now. Running a virtual machine will also require you to spend more money on RAM, and Apple's insane upgrade prices are a tough pill to swallow. Oh, another thing. If it wasn't obvious enough, Macs aren't gaming PCs. While the MacBook Air does run Minecraft and other games very well, fuck you, fuck your mom, fuck your dad, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. There are games that I'd like to try, like Valorant, that just aren't available for Mac OS, which is a huge bummer. How to use a Mac for gaming. Step one, open your Mac. Step two, install Steam. Step three, open Steam. Step four, close your Mac and get an actual PC. You are now using your Mac for gaming. Speaking of software, there's also the issue of software optimization. Most apps are built for x86 CPUs. Then Apple was like, here, take this thing with a new CPU architecture called ARM, which is like more efficient and it will generate less heat, but you'll have to rewrite apps to work properly. Basically, there are two different types of architectures. Imagine taking Lego and um, uh, these big mega blocks x86 is Lego, the more common one, and ARM is the Mega Blocks. You want your x86 blocks to work with the ARM blocks. So what do you do? Well, you can tape them together. The tape in this metaphor is something the engineers at Apple cooked up called Rosetta 2. Rosetta 2 is a translation layer that allows apps not natively designed for ARM to run on an Apple Silicon Mac. So I can run Intel Photoshop on my ARM Mac. However, like the tape solution for Lego and Mega Blocks, it's not ideal. Most apps run fine, but you're still losing performance compared to if you ran it natively. You should keep in mind that developers are constantly adding support for Apple Silicon for their apps, but there are some applications that might just never get the support. 
Now, I'm sure you've heard of Apple's walled garden before. Basically, it's like a nice, pretty place. The more Apple devices you buy, the nicer the garden gets and the higher the walls get. Apple is very addicting. Less than two years ago, in 2020, I got this iPhone 7. Then I needed a new computer, so I got a used 2015 MacBook Pro to get me by. In 2021, during online school, I thought an iPad would be beneficial to my studies and I got one of those. The more Apple devices you get, the more locked in you get. You get used to AirDrop, to iMessage, to handoff, to universal clipboard and universal control, the sidecar, and to the general ecosystem that Apple builds around you. And the small conveniences make it harder and harder to break free. Now, for some, this is a good thing. Tightly integrated devices that work together to make you more efficient, sounds great. For others, the ecosystem is way too locked down. It makes it difficult to switch away from Apple, and that lack of flexibility is really quite unappealing to a lot of people. So if you have an iPhone already, and you're thinking of getting a Mac, be aware that you might be raising the walls for yourself. Just keep in mind that Apple has built all sorts of little traps to keep you locked in their tech ecosystem, in their walled garden, and who knows, you might like it here, you might not. And here's the one that really grinds my gears. In terms of hardware upgrades and repairability in general, Apple is a huge douchebag using anti-consumer measures to intentionally block users from performing repairs and upgrades and disabling features just because you used a non-genuine part and sometimes even an actual genuine Apple part. Let me tell you about a computer called the Mac Studio. The Mac Studio has storage modules that could be accessed and removed by the end user. So naturally, some people were like, hey, let's try swapping the drives and see if we can upgrade the storage in this thing. Is this the return of Mac repairability? F no. Apple intentionally put a software lock on the Mac Studio's drives that wouldn't allow the computer to work if you used a drive that wasn't from the original model itself. It would literally blink out SOS and Morse code, suggesting that Apple intentionally programmed the thing to not accept other SSDs. So what was the point of telling you about this? Well, you should be aware that Apple is a pretty sh** company that does a bunch of anti-consumer sh** to ultimately drive up their profits. So if you buy an Apple Silicon Mac, remember that none of the components on the machine are upgradable. The amount of RAM you buy with your machine is the RAM your machine will be forever stuck with. The amount of storage you buy with your machine is the amount your machine will be forever stuck with. If you break something, you'll probably have to send it into Apple and pay them a hefty price for their repair. So you're thinking, okay, that's fine. I'll just upgrade the Mac when I'm purchasing it then. And I'll just be extra careful with my new Mac. Oh yeah, you know the computer part that degrades the quickest? The battery? Yeah, good luck trying to replace that yourself and praying that it doesn't explode like Lewis Rossman's did. It's nearly impossible for the average consumer to replace a battery for their own MacBook, although Apple would gladly sell the repair to you for 259 Canadian dollars. Granted, Apple Silicon Macs have great battery life, and even if they are degraded, they'll still last you a decent amount of battery time, and Apple has put in measures to optimize and maintain the battery for as long as possible, so it's not a huge issue, but it's definitely there. But then we get to the SSD, which is another degradable factor in the laptop. You see, each SSD has a maximum amount of terabytes you can write to the SSD before it starts to fail. There's no doubt Apple uses very high quality SSDs in their Macs, which means their terabytes written limit is probably very high, meaning that generally, the SSDs will last a very long time. In fact, most people will probably buy a new computer before their old computer's SSD starts to show signs of failure. That being said, this is something you should keep in mind, especially if you use your SSD very intensely, and do remember that if your SSD does die while you're using it, then it's dead for good, along with all your data and the computer. So always, always back things up. In a nutshell, if your apps work with Apple Silicon and you're comfortable with switching to Mac OS and Apple's lockdown approach to both hardware and software, then go ahead on getting an Apple Silicon Mac. Now, I've talked a lot of negative stuff about Apple Silicon in this video, but to be honest, Apple Silicon Macs provide wonderful build quality, excellent displays, stunning battery life, great thermal management, and probably industry-leading performance per watt. And I'll still be recommending an M1 MacBook Air to most people who ask me which laptop will you get because it just provides so much value at a price point that's actually pretty reasonable. If you do purchase a Mac and you find it doesn't seem to be working out, Apple has a 15 day return policy available in most regions that you can use, but make sure it's available in your country. If you guys wanna learn more about Apple's World Garden, I'll be making a video about it that should be up sometime soon. 
also be reviewing my M1 MacBook Air sometime soon. So if you're thinking about getting an M1 MacBook Air, but you're unsure, be sure to subscribe for either of those. And if you're watching in the future, then I've probably already added the videos in the cards above. So go ahead and click on those. If you're unsure about which MacBook Airs you should buy, then click the card thing in the top right corner right now and you'll see a comparison between the M1 and the M2 MacBook Air and why I personally chose the M1 MacBook Air right here. Anyway, thanks for popping by again. A like and sub would be very appreciated and it will take you very little time, so why not? Anyway, that's it for this video. Maybe stay behind for the post-party poopers and I'll see you guys later. Adios. Um, hello? Okay, so I need some fan noise sound effects. So I've actually gotten my old ancient 2015 MacBook Pro and uh, time to go to town. Mm, look at the color keyframe.